Show yeah, show it. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning at Word Vancouver and for this panel, Art of the Pitch. My name is Jessica Key. I am the chair of the Magazine Association of British Columbia, and I'm also the managing editor at Subterrain Magazine. Um, before we get going, I would like to acknowledge that this festival takes place on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. Um, and I would also like to remind everyone that they can support Word Vancouver online by becoming a member and through their silent auction at wordvancouver.com. Or I believe there's also ways to participate in the silent auction in person right outside this door. Um, we'd also like to take a moment to thank our generous donors and sponsors, the Canada Arts Council, the Canada Heritage Fund, BC Gaming, Creative BC, the City of Vancouver, DBVIA, the Hamber Foundation, the Yosef Wask Foundation, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, Pace and Associates, the Federation of BC Writers, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, and of course, UBC Robson and the Surrey Library for hosting the events this weekend. For a full list of our partners, please visit the website. And without both those partners and donors, as well as all of your attendance, this festival could not happen. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists who are generously donating their time and knowledge today. Starting on the far end, uh, Shashi Bhatt is the author of three books of fiction, including The Most Pre Precious Substance on Earth, which was shortlisted for the 2022 Governor General's Award, and a forthcoming story collection, Death by a Thousand Cuts, which will be coming out with McClelland and Stewart in 2024. Her fiction has appeared in publications across Canada, including Best Canadian Stories, and she was the winner of the 2018 Journey Prize. And she's with us today as the editor-in-chief of Event Magazine. Uh, Vincent Beiser is an award-winning journalist and author of The World in a Grain, The Story of Sand and How It Transforms Civilization. The book has been translated into five languages, was a finalist for a Penn America Award and a California Book Award, and spawned a TEDx talk. Vince is currently at work on a new book, Power Metal, about how the shift to renewable energy is, while urgently necessary, also causing environmental havoc, political upheaval, and murder, and how we can do better. Vince has reported from over 100 countries, states, provinces, kingdoms, occupied territories, no man's lands, and disaster zones. He has exposed conditions in California's harshest prisons, trained with troops bound for Iraq, uh, written with the first responders to national, natural disasters, and hunted down other stories from around the world for publications including Wired, The Atlantic, Harper's, Time, The Guardian, Mother Jones, Playboy, Rolling Stone, The Los Angeles Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. His work has been honored by investigative reporters and editors, the Society of Professional Journalists, the American Society of Journalists and Authors, the Columbia, Medill, and Missouri Graduate Schools of Journalism, and many other institutions. He has three times been part of a team that won the National Magazine Award for General Excellence and shared in an Emmy for his work on the PBS TV special, SoCal Connected. He is also a grantee of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Repo. And we have Christy Alexandra, who is a co-editor-in-chief at Loose Lips Magazine and a freelance journalist, editor, and proud working mom. When she's not at home watching Disney Plus with her daughter, you can often find her taking in the city's latest cinema at film festivals, or patronizing the local music scene. Her passions are music, culture, travel, and film, but, uh, but above all, writing about them. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, so for our format today, I have um, some questions that I'm gonna be asking all of our panelists. And then I will also give the opportunity um, closer to the end. If anyone has had any other questions come up, please feel free to put up your hands and we can uh, use these incredible brains to answer some of your questions about the art of the pitch. Um, so I gave everyone uh, their bios already, but I'm interested if you have anything else in particular you'd like to introduce about yourself insofar as it applies to the art of pitching and the panel, your work as a journalist or editor, um, as well as for Christy and Shashi, if you want to speak a little bit about the magazines that you work with. Um, why don't we start with Christy for this one? Yeah, sure. I think um, I saw Vince put in like all the places that he has pitched to and I was like, I'm just a jerk. So I've worked, um, I've had bylines like in the Georgia Strait, the Vancouver Sun. I've worked at um, like community newspapers in Surrey, et cetera. So 
um, yeah, so I have done a lot of pitching to publications. Um, Loose Lips Magazine, which is where I'm at right now, is a feminist focused magazine. So we write about women and gender diverse people. Um, and it's mostly arts and culture focused. So what are people doing in the city and how are they making change? Great. Uh, Vince? Yeah, well, I've been, um, I guess the reason I'm here is I've been a, a freelance journalist for a long, long time. So I've pitched to, you know, all kinds of magazines that, you know, I listed all the fancy ones, but I've also written for <laughs> all kinds of, you know, little magazines and niche magazines and obscure magazines and lots of magazines that don't exist anymore, which is part of why I do books now. Um, and I've also been an editor along the way. I worked at Mother Jones as an editor for a while and a few other places. So I've I've kind of been on both sides of, of the whole pitching process, which, and believe me, it's it can be excruciating from either side. So, but there's definitely ways to, you know, things you can do to make it less painful and more sort of more productive. So, hope we'll talk about some of that. Fantastic. And Shashi? Yeah. Um, so I'm a fiction writer. So most of my publications, aside from books, have been in literary magazines. So it's really hard to hear. I don't know oh, sorry. <laughs> You're competing with the relationship. Uh, yeah. So I'm a fiction writer. So um, most of my publications have been short stories in literary magazines. Uh, so a little bit different, probably, than the pitching process for you guys. Um, I've been at Event since 2014. Um, Event is a nationally distributed literary magazine. We're based at Douglas College in New Westminster, um, and we're in our 52nd year of publication. We publish short fiction, poetry, creative nonfiction, and book reviews, and also what we call notes on writing, which are um, like short personal essays from notable writers across Canada talking about their writing lives. Fantastic. Thanks for all of that, everyone. Um, just for a bit more context on me, in addition to working as the chair of Mags BC, as the managing editor of Subterrain, um, we're set up quite similarly to events. We do fiction, um, nonfiction, commentary, poetry, book reviews, and art. Um, so when I do speak on as the host here, I'm also coming from a perspective of we don't necessarily take pitches per se, but we're also, we'll be talking about the submission process for those magazines that do submissions as opposed to pitches. Um, so that actually leads into the next question, which is how does your magazine handle acquisitions? Um, is it pitches? Do you solicit pieces from writers that you have established relationships with? Do you have open calls for applications or slush, pi slush piles? Etc. There's all sorts of ways that uh, magazines make this work. So uh, why don't we actually go back to you for that one? Yeah, so most of our content is unsolicited and we have a couple of open submission periods per year um, in the fall and then in the winter and it's all accepted online through the submittable platform. Um, and then there are a couple exceptions to that. So for the notes on writing, I commission them and I just reach out to writers across Canada and ask them to give us essays. Um, our creative nonfiction comes mostly through our annual nonfiction contest. So every October, October 15th is our deadlines coming up. Um, we get nonfiction submissions and we publish the contest winners and then sometimes some other ones that we really liked. Um, Book reviews are solicited by our reviews editor. And then if people are interested in writing book reviews, you can also reach out to our reviews editor. So it's kind of a mix. Uh, Vince, is there anything you want to speak about um, as a journalist and writer? What do you think is like kind of the most common ways that you've reached out to magazines or uh, news publications? Like, have you found it is mostly pitching a story? Is it sending a completed story? Yeah, we, sure. I mean, in the at least in my part of the journalism world, it's you, it's always the pitch first, right? You pretty much never want to submit a complete work, right? Because it's a it's a it's a different thing from from writing fiction, right? It's not about you're not trying to express something yourself. You're really like trying to get some information across to get a you know to get to sort of raise awareness about an issue. So you want to make sure that that whoever you're pitching to is actually interested in that thing first. So uh, can you hear me now, by the way? Better. Yeah, still not so much. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, so 
so yeah, if you're doing what I do, which is more sort of like news, social issues kind of features, it's, it's always a pitch first. And I guess the main things, two things that I say, always say every pitch has got to have is what's the story and, and why you, and that's basically like, you got to be able to, to sum up your story, you know, as short and sharp and, and, and catchily as you can. That's number one. That's the thing they care about most is what's the story. And then why you, why are you the person to write it? You know, especially if this is, you know, if it's somebody that you're pitching that you've never worked with before, and especially if you don't have a whole lot of, you know, other clips and, and, and stuff to fall back on, like what, what kind of special access do you have or what connection do you have to this subject or to this story? What's, what is it about you that, that uh, makes you the person to write this? Yeah, I totally agree with all of that. And I have some notes about that later. Um, so I'll say if, as far as Loose Lips magazine goes, um, I came from a background of music journalism. Like about 10 years ago, I was the managing editor of Beatroot BC and we would do um, pitch meetings. So basically like anyone who wanted to write for us, we'd like come to our office, we'd pass around a bunch of beers and then we'd have like a list of stories be like, okay, like who wants to interview deer hunter this month? And so um, I really liked that format, although it was kind of just like a bunch of people in their early twenties hanging out. Um, but I loved that format. So when I started Loose Lips Magazine, we sort of took that format and we're like, hey, why don't we get everybody together like over pizza or just meet at a coffee shop and we would, um, just talk and hang out and be like, okay, who wants to take this pitch or what pitches do you have? And so it was really face to face. Um, as time went on and we got a little bit more known and people wanted to write for us, um, that's when we kind of stopped those meetings. And so I will just take cold pitch emails um, and I've gotten some fantastic pitches and with writers that I still work with. Um, and then also, yeah, the, uh, the way that it also goes is that when I get a really good relationship with a writer, somebody who's great with their deadlines, always has a good pitch idea. I just keep them on call and I'm like, if I have a pitch for them, I'm reaching out to them now rather than the other way around. Um, at Subtrain, we are quite similar to events. Um, most of our work does actually come to us through online submissions, unsolicited slush pile through submittable. We do also accept mailed in submissions still as well for those who do not want to deal with submittable. Um, we have in the last year or so moved to probably having a quarter to a third of our content be solicited as well, reaching out to um, particularly up and coming writers that we've seen in other magazines or seen them beginning to publish collections at some of our literary colleagues um, in the book world. And we reach out to them and ask if they have anything that fits our mandate and our kind of style. Um, book reviews are also solicited, though we are always looking for more reviewers. So um, we just have folks email us with examples of previous book reviews they've written in like a little bio if they're interested in getting on that list. Um, so one of the things that actually Vince began touching on is, um, you know, how to pitch and submit. And my next question was actually about how does one prep for that before you're actually sending the pitch. How much pre-research do you do? Do you set up interviews? Um, what is kind of that invisible work behind the pitch before you actually send it? Uh, Vince, do you actually want to speak to that one first? Sure. I'm still sort of reeling about the idea of sitting around with a bunch of editors and drinking <laughs> beers and pitching ideas. That's like, that's it's just the, fun. It was fun. I yeah. believe it. That's yeah. the dream pitching session. Wow. <laughs> Wouldn't that ever happened to me. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, this is, a, that's a really good question. Like how much, basically how to gear up for a story. Um, and I actually, I used to teach a whole class on exactly this. And if anybody's really interested, I have a, a whole handout on exactly that topic that I can email to you. If you're interested, you can hit me up afterwards. But, um, in a nutshell, at least, you know, for, for what I do, it's always a balance, right? Because you want to know that there's a story there. You want to come to the editor saying, yes, there, this is a real thing that's going on. It's a real issue. This person is really worth talking about. So you have to do a little bit of at least a certain amount of research beforehand, but you don't want to end up spending, you know, hours and hours and hours doing something, working on a story that you might not sell. So it's always this kind of balance. 
And I found that that balance really like it shifts throughout your career. You know, like when you're starting out, the onus is much more on you. Like you've got to do a lot more work up front and really bring to them like a story like this is the story and it's here's why it matters and here's how I'm going to do it. And I've already gotten in touch with the main people and they're willing to show me around and talk to me. So what do you say? All right for you. Um, whereas, you know, the more like once you've got a better relationship going on and they trust you a little more, it, it's easier to come to them with an idea that's, you know, not as fully fleshed out. But um, but yeah, basically you want to you've got to you've got at least there's two things that I always that I always say you got to know when the first thing is who else has done what on this. Right. Because whatever your subject is, you know, almost certainly somebody else has written something about it and if it's already been covered to death then you know even though it might be a really important topic the chance of selling it are really really low like um so you want to do some research on that especially like see who else has done what on it and then figure out like okay even if this topic's been covered a lot like how can i what's a new way that i can bring to it what's a new angle or some new person that hasn't been you know some new personality involved um and then and sort of go from there and then figure out like, okay, you've heard about this topic, but what you haven't heard is this piece of the topic. So right. I feel like that's enough talking for now. Yeah. Chris, would you I, like to speak to this next? Yeah. I feel like that's a fantastic point. I think when you are structuring your pitches, you do have to think about the reasons why somebody would want to publish this story. And so my main checks are always like, it's timely. Like, do they have a book coming out? Do they have a, album coming out um it you know is it just something in the general zeitgeist right now that's being talked about um so that's like so timely relevant and then also like if you're talking about a person or something that's happening is it like is it new information like is this so and so is one of the first to you know um figure out the next covid vaccine or something like that it's like it has to be like fresh new one of the first and what's your special access to it i also would keep in mind like what's your how um how likely is it that you're going to be able to carry out this story mm -hmm. because if an editor green lights something for you you want to be able to turn around and be like okay great they actually already agreed to interview so now it's just a matter of doing the interview um what kind of like you were saying earlier like what access do you have that another writer doesn't have um, that a publication is going to want to be like, yeah, I want, I want you on this because I know you can get it done. Shashi, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, so it's uh, quite different at literary magazines where the piece you're submitting is already finished and I would say it should be as good as you can get it before you send it to us. Um, I, I guess like in terms of uh, like the preparation you would do, I would just suggest reading the magazine and getting a sense of it before you submit because there are things that we, we don't publish. Um, yeah, reading the guidelines on the website. It might sound obvious, but sometimes we get things like when I'm reading um, like the, the early round submissions of poetry, there'll be a poem that's like, rhyming and stopped and center justified. And if you were just to flip through one issue of the magazine, you would know that we don't publish that. So just familiarizing yourself with the magazine before submitting. Yeah, and if you sent us a pitch, we probably wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just say that that actually really goes for, for pitching any magazine, like read it in advance, you know, know it, learn what they're, you know, what kind of stuff they're looking for and what kind of format they're looking for. And that'll also really help you craft your pitch, you know, because you, especially if you can say like, hey, this would be perfect for your, you know, your lifestyle section or your hard news section or, you know, but if they don't have that section, then you kind of, it, that's not the greatest way to pitch them for sure. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think it might sound really obvious, but Shashi um, touched on like, definitely if there are writer's guidelines available, read those, know them. We get sent things that are way too long at Subterrain all the time. We have specific maximum word counts and it doesn't matter how great a piece is, we can't print one piece that takes up half of our page count. So it, that piece isn't going to be accepted even if it's absolutely brilliant and we might otherwise wish we could. Um, yeah, researching, <laughs> like reading it again, um, Subterrain we have 
a point of view, a kind of vibe in the pieces we publish. And quite often I'll get things submitted to us where I say like, you know, this is a really great piece, but it's not for us. But I unfortunately don't have the time to write every single person who submits that and be like, you know, you should really send this to event per se. Sometimes I'll do it if I really, really love it. And I'm like, I want to see this published, but I don't have time to do that when we get 200 to 500 submissions per issue. Um, so yeah, read, read it and read the writer's guidelines always. Um, we've kind of started talking about some of these already in answering the previous questions, but I just wanted to talk about what are some of your just like main high level, like do's and don'ts of pitching and submitting. Um, why don't we start on this end of the table this time? Sure, yeah, I made a list <laughs> of kind of my top ones. Um, one, I, I kind of mentioned this, but the piece you submit should be finished and carefully edited before you send it to us. Um, in the first round of reading, I often see submissions that read like first drafts um, and they like, they might have ideas that have potential, but they just feel kind of half-baked or underdeveloped. And even at our fiction meetings, I found, especially recently, the most common reason we'll reject a story is because it feels underdeveloped. Um, like the idea is, is there, but it's just not uh, fully realized. Um, so I would just take your time with a story mm -hmm. before submitting it. Um, do read the submission guidelines, just as you were saying, like we, we get stuff that's over the word count. Um, we don't publish um, work that kind of adheres to uh, like genre tropes, for example. Um, I wanted to touch on cover letters because uh, I think this might be a little bit different um, in that sometimes we get cover letters where people do seem to be trying to kind of sell themselves or pitch us or summarize their story and you don't need to do that at all. Um, it's just pure business communication like name, contact info, genre, word count, bio, and that's, that's pretty much it. And I would let your work speak for itself. Um, do consider entering contests. Um, there is usually an entry fee for, for entering contests. Typically, at least with literary magazines around here, it's about $30, but it includes a one-year subscription, which is also about $30, so it's a pretty good deal, I think. Um, and then once you're entering a com contest, it kind of limits the competition, like the pool you're competing against is a little bit smaller. Um, so, and I know it does cost money to submit, but maybe like when I was submitting to contests, I would just choose one or two that I really wanted to enter in a year and do that. Um, I think I have one more. Oh, don't take it personally if you get rejected. Um, just to get give you an idea of what it's like at event, um, like we cap our submission numbers because if we didn't, we would have thousands of submissions and we just would not be able to read them. Um, and like so, per genre, we might get um, like 1,200 fiction submissions a year and publish 12 stories. So a lot of the stuff we're rejecting is it's not bad. Like we reject some very good stories. Um, and if you ever get a rejection letter that's specific in its feedback, I would take that as a like, very encouraging sign and submit again uh, a different story as promptly as you can, because uh, we will remember your name. That sounds like some great advice. Um, and I echo it at Subtrain as well. Like we, as mentioned, we get hundreds of submissions per issue. We are an 80 to 90 page magazine, depending on the issue. We reject a lot of really phenomenal work. And again, if you ever get a specific rejection letter, take that to heart, resubmit. If there is any feedback on the piece, consider that when you're actually refining it before you submit it elsewhere. Um, Vince? Yeah, I think don't take it personally is, is a fantastic piece of advice because you're going to get a lot of rejections and it's, you know, it's not necessarily anything to do with the quality of your work or who you are. Mm -hmm. It's just like basically everybody, you know, anybody who's putting out a publication is getting deluged with stuff. And half the time they can't even, you know, read half the stuff that comes in. Um, this is a true story that I remind myself about whenever I feel like that. I was way back when, when I was, when I was starting out, I thought I wanted to be a, a war journalist. And I was, I spent about a year in Bosnia back during the Bosnia war though. And at the time, I thought the coolest publication in the world was The Village Voice in New York. I just so wanted to write for The Village Voice, always wanted to. So the whole time I was over there, 
I was pitching them nonstop. This is like very early internet days. So I was like faxing them stuff, <laughs> you know, seriously. And like sending them letters and every now and then I'd like break down and like try to call them. Nothing, nothing didn't never heard back from them once the whole time I was there, not even a response. So about a year or two later, I wind up living in New York and I'm still pitching the village voice, still trying to break in there. And finally, like somebody returns my call. Oh my God, I'm so excited. And I get to go there and I sit down with the big editor and he's like, oh yeah, well, we really liked your pitch. You know, I think we're going to run your story. Yes. And he's like, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, what, uh, where are you from? And I was like, well, uh, you know, I grew up here and there and then uh, I was uh, in Bosnia for a year. And he goes, Bosnia? Oh, you should have pitched us from there. We would have loved to have had some stuff from there. <laughs> so God knows what happened to all those pitches that I sent. They just, you know, they're somewhere probably sitting in a slush pile still to this day. But, you know, moral of the story is don't take it personally. Who knows what happened to your pitch? You know, who knows if anybody had time to read it, but don't soldier on. That's that's the moral of the story. I, yeah, I guess. I feel yes. that you probably did. <laughs> I tried, but I, you know, we learned the most from our mistakes, I guess. Yeah. I think to, to follow up on that, that sort of is my due because editors do get a lot of pitches and sometimes we're like open an email and then a bunch of other things come in. So I would say what you do want to do if you've got a really great pitch is do follow up once or twice. I mean, if you're following up five times, like maybe at that point you're annoying somebody, but, but follow up once or twice and I would give it like a week and then another week and just making sure that you saw this. Um, and here's, here's my don't. Don't simultaneously pitch your story to multiple editors or publications at the same time. Um, that is kind of a journalism no-no. So you do have to wait for a rejection before you move on. Um, and so that's why I say follow up once or twice, because if you've got a great story and you're like, it's going to fit this, you know, this is your number one publication that you want it to go to. It's going to fit this publication. You probably have an interview in the wings. Um, follow up once and say, hey, if I... Um, if you're not interested in this, let me know by X date, maybe, um, because then I'll move on. You know, I've got a really great lead here. And then the twice is like, okay, I'm moving on to another publication. But if two publications love this story and they're like, one's like, yes, the second one's like, yes, you're going to have to break it to one editor. Oh, I'm actually not going to do this story with you. And that's kind of a burned bridge uh, depending on who you're working with. But yeah, it doesn't, doesn't reflect great um and then do have contact with your subject ready or or know that you can get this story done um and know that you can carry out the pitch because if somebody green lights something and you're like oh actually um that interview fell through but i have this other pitch for you the editor's like no i i green lit this other pitch so that's one other thing and then also um don't promise on a deadline that you can't deliver like in your pitch you want to be really clear about your subject, you know, kind of how fast you can get it done, what your word count is. Um, so once your editor says yes to all that, and then you come back later and are like, oh, I'm actually not going to be able to get it done. It kind of um, messes with the workflow a bit because sometimes you're working on like a, a printing deadline. Other times it's like, a, oh, we're doing like an issue drop and that's online sort of holds up the whole process. Yeah. Can I can I just yeah. follow up on two things you said there? So one, I totally agree. Following up super important, mm -hmm. and I all I really recommend following up by phone, which is mm. terrifying to like most <laughs> writers. Yeah, I know, but um, and uh, including me, but like I just found like I mean I always first follow up I always do is by email for mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. but I also like email is just so easy to ignore. You know, we all get so, so many emails and they just look the same. And, um, and phone calls really like still have a, have a way of punching through, even though I know like most of us like do not want to like talk to an editor. Like there's a reason we're writers. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I don't know, for me, I found it, I just found it super effective because so many times, like I, you know, I'd screw up my nerve and I'd call the editor and I'd actually get them on the phone and they'd be like, Oh, that sounds like an interesting story. Oh, oh yeah, here it is. Oh, I didn't even see that it happened. It happens a lot. And what I would always to like sort of deal with the like terror of talking to an editor, I would pull up the pitch. I'd have the pitch sitting there on my screen. So if you actually get them, if they actually pick up their phone, because usually you're just leaving them a voicemail, right? Mm -hmm. But if you actually get them on the phone, 
you don't want to, what you don't want to say is like, oh, I, I pitched you something. I think it's in your email queue. Please take a look for it. Bye. Right. No. <laughs> yeah. You want to be like, oh, you didn't see it. Well, here's the story in a nutshell. And you can kind of basically just read out your pitch to them right then and there. So I found that was helpful. And it also like set my nerves at ease. But also on the thing of simultaneous submissions, this is, it's kind of a controversial thing. I like most editors will tell you, don't ever do that. Mm -hmm. My personal philosophy is do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to hear why. Why? Because most of the time you never hear back, right? Most right. pitches that you send out there, <laughs> you never hear back anything. You don't even get a no. Right. Okay. And okay. especially if you're, if you're doing a, like a news, anything that's like pegged to the news, anything that's like a current event that you kind of need to get out there right. quickly. You need to, if you, if you like pitch to one magazine and you wait for three weeks to hear back from them, you never hear back. And then you pitch to the next magazine. You don't hear back from them either. Like you're going to starve doing that. Yeah. So oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so what I do is, uh, my feeling was always like, God, I should be so lucky that two editors want this story. I, usually right. it's like nobody wants it. So, so what I, what I did is like, I would, uh, I pitched to like two or three different publications and I would say that like at the end of the pitch, I'll just like, by the way, also pitching it to a few other publications. Um, but of course you're my first choice, you know, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, point. yeah, it only, it's only ever happened to me once in like 30 years of doing this stuff. Only once did I have two publications who both said yes. And what happened? They were both totally cool. With it. I went with the bigger and the more prestigious one and the right, smaller. Right, like whoever's going to pay me more. Yeah. <laughs> and the smaller one was the editor there was like, fine, I get it. You yeah. Know? So, so it is, you know, it can burn a bridge theoretically, but, uh, Anyway, there you have it. Editor yeah. says no, writer says yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up to you. I feel like both of these two things are very different at literary magazines. <laughs> I would say don't phone a literary magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Partly I'm saying that because our managing editor, Chris, is over there and she will have to field the voicemail. <laughs> um, but there are like two of us who work at the office every day and we're, we're like at capacity, <laughs> like we, we probably won't answer. I would say like our reading response time is six months. So I wouldn't uh, contact us to follow up um, until after at least six months have passed. Um, and I would do it by email or through the submittable platform. And then the other one, oh, simultaneous submission. So at LitMix, at least in Canada, typically most of them do accept sim simultaneous submissions. I would just note that in your cover letter, like this is under consideration at other journals. Um, and, and what you should absolutely do is let us know if it has been accepted somewhere else. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I feel like we kind of darted a glance of each other on both of those because <laughs> um, as said, it, it is pretty different at literary magazines. Same thing. Please never call me. I'm a millennial and I work from home. Like, <laughs> I was um, going to say the same. You yeah, can find me on Instagram and DM me if you yes, really want. Yes, exactly. Um, we have a very similar reading time about six months. Um, so yeah, following up via submittable or via email, totally great. But we give it that six months. Every once in a while, something will unfortunately slip through the cracks and it's been eight months and that's a great time to be like, hello, like, please, please let me know, um, which is super fine. For us, we do allow simultaneous submissions, but definitely the second you find out from another publication that they're publishing you, please let us know because it's very frustrating when we are like, okay, yes, we send an acceptance to someone and they're like, oh, actually this piece is getting published elsewhere. And I'm like, oh, well, that would have been Right to know. Yeah, exactly. Um, the only exception to that is our Lush Triumphant Literary Awards. Um, we spoke a little bit about contests earlier, and with the awards, they are just a huge part of our workload, the reading on those. So we do ask that those are not simultaneous submissions. So, in general, most places will have um, their rules about simultaneous submissions obvious on their website. And if it's not, I would say it's completely reasonable to drop them an email to ask what their uh, rules are on that. Um, so we've talked a little bit about like the structure of a pitch, but just like concretely, like what do you want to see included in a pitch? What don't you want to see included in a pitch? And for emerging writers who maybe don't have a lot of publications to list in their cover letter or pitch, 
Is there any other ways that you think that they can make themselves stand out? Christy, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. So I've been waiting for this because I have eight <laughs> steps to a great pitch email. So first of all, when you introduce yourself, short and sweet, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm a writer based in X city. Um, if you have bylines other places, I have bylines in XX and X publication. I'm excited to pitch to you today. So like, I don't need to know every scholarship or award that you've ever gotten. The story is about the story, not about the person. And so yeah, just keep it short and sweet. Um, introduce your subject right away um, and show that it's gonna be a great story by three, flexing your writing skills already. So um, it's probably, you know, unless you're like Lester Bangs, it's unlikely that even if you're a, like a really well-published person that somebody's going to know your name anyway. Um, so flex those writing skills in the email. And so like a great pitch to me always includes the lead of the story. Like give me a taste of how you're going to write this already. Um, you can also say why this publication um, and, and show, don't tell. Be like, you know, Loose Lips readership is, you know, if you want to like fluff my feathers a bit, like a bunch of smart feminists and I, I think that this subject goes with blah, blah, blah. Um, you don't want to tell them what to do with their publication, but like show them that you've read the publication and you understand their readership. Um, add your clips and writing samples if you can. And that's just a link. Even if you actually don't have writing samples from other publications, like put a link to your like three best blog posts that you've ever done. Um, include your word count or the format. So like you were saying, like in the lifestyle section, I envision mm -hmm. this or like be like, I see this as an 800 word profile on, you know, like women on motorbikes or something. Um, and then prepare, be prepared to get on the story ASAP if they green light it right away. Just make sure that you have those contacts in place and that you can get it done and then sign off and cross your fingers and follow up if you don't hear back in a week. Excellent. Uh, Vince? Yeah, that I I, I second all of that. <laughs> no disagreements on this question. No okay. disagreements. I mean, just, yeah, I think that was really concise. I could, if I think of anything to add, I'll let you know. Okay, great. <laughs> and you spoke a little bit about what you're looking for at event in a cover letter, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, I guess in terms of bio, you can just mention previous publications, whether you have any related education or writing experience. If you're uh, like, you don't have any publication credits that doesn't work against you like we're always excited to find to, to feel like we discovered a new writer so you could even say uh if accepted in event this would be my first publication and, and yeah that won't be a reason not to publish you yeah i i echo that at subterrain we get really really excited about emerging writers absolutely and quite often when i'm assessing submissions i actually jump past the cover letter and read it so i'm kind of reading the submission blind and really looking at it on its own merit. And then if I like it, I'll actually go back and read the cover letter after that and be like, oh, that's that's interesting. I'm actually familiar with this writer's work or, oh, they're very emerging. They just, let's say, finished the UBC MFA and et cetera. But I, I really try not to let a person's um, publications or accolades affect my reading of their work because it really is about the work. Um, and I think it is important to note that like you don't need an MFA or a bunch of publications to get into a literary magazine. Everyone starts somewhere. Um, it's as someone who actually does have a master's degree, it's really important for me at the magazine to not make it inaccessible to be in our pages or to work with us as an intern or anything like that. Like higher education is great if it works for you, but it is absolutely not necessary to be in a magazine. Um, so I think we've talked a lot about what can make a pitch stand out, what you're looking for when assessing it. Um, one of the things that we touched on a little bit earlier is about um, soliciting work. And um, I was wondering if anyone wanted to talk a bit about how those relationships get formed as your magazine or as a journalist, how you formed those relationships with editors. And if there's um, any advice you'd give a writer who's looking to get on a specific publication's roster for soliciting work. <laughs> Uh, Vince, do you want to speak to that one first? Um, sure, yeah. So I guess, I mean, probably the number one thing is like, do your job well, right? If you get an assignment, I mean, 
if you get an assignment and you can deliver it, you deliver it by the deadline at the word count. That's that right there puts you like in the top, you know, 25% of all freelancers, right? It doesn't have to be brilliant. It doesn't have to be like, you know, sparkling pros, but just like if you actually just delivered the goods you said you were going to do, that's you're, you're already ahead of the pack. Uh, and if you can do that consistently, editors are going to love you, right? I mean, that, that's always been my experience from both sides of it. Um, so, so that's the number one thing. And then too, you know, of course, like anything you can do to like, once you've, you know, once you've, you've got a bit of a working relationship going, anything that you can do to kind of, you know, warm up that relationship, um, uh, especially these days, right. When everything's, you know, when hardly anybody uses the phone and almost everything's happening digitally, like I used to, um, I'd make a, a point of, you know, this only applies if you're really trying to do this for for your living but i would make a point of, of going to new york once every year or two because most of the magazines that i was writing for and or trying to write for were in new york and i would so i would spend go out there and spend a few days just going around and trying to meet with people in person right like people that i'd worked with already just to say hey oh hey i just happen to be in town i mind if i drop by you know even though the only reason i'm in town is like to try and schmooze these people up but, but um, <laughs> But it just made, I found it makes a huge difference, right? Like once you've met somebody face to face, the, you've just got a way much more of a, a much stronger connection with them. Um, and that goes for people that you already have a connection with and people that you're trying to get a connection with, right? If you can pitch somebody face to face, that's way more, it's way more powerful. It's way more potent. So, you know, to the extent that you can do that kind of thing, I really, I recommend it. And I'm, I'm just a big believer in like trying to get together with people in person whenever you can, you know, if they're local folks, whatever, just, you know, offer to, you know, meet them for coffee or drop by their office or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll stop talking now. How about an event? Yeah, so for um, the notes on writing, our main solicited pieces, um, I just ask writers that I feel might have something interesting to say. Um, for example, in our upcoming notes on writing issue, we have a piece by Fawn Parker. Uh, and she had first had a short story published in an event that we, we found really interesting. Um, and it was a journey prize. It was on the long list, I think. Um, and then I read an article article by her in catapult about like drafting a novel in 30 days and i just found it really fascinating and motivating so i reached out to her to write an essay um so sometimes we do ask past contributors sometimes it's just writers i see writing interesting things elsewhere um i thought i'd also call back to that the question about like what we look for when we're assessing a submission and what makes a piece stand out. And I thought I could just tell you how our fiction meetings work, like how we decide what we publish. Um, so there are four of us on the fiction committee and first readers um, recommend pieces. And then for every meeting we uh, have maybe four or five stories that we'll read and we'll come prepared with notes and we'll discuss and then vote and then sometimes do a little more discussion. And when we're voting, our options are strong publish, weak publish, weak reject, uh, strong reject. And then there are these two other categories, the rarely used categories. One is not over my dead body, <laughs> which I've only seen used once in like in the past wow. 10 years. And then there's Ouch. the one Take would, that one personally. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for me, the, the big one is I would fight for this story. Um, and now when I'm submitting my own fiction, I always think like, I want to submit the story that an editor will fight for. Um, and what makes that story could, could vary. For me, it's just like, I want something that moves me. Um, and it, you know, you, a story might have sharp prose and compelling characters and narrative momentum and all of that stuff, but ultimately I just want to feel something. Yeah. Christy? Good, good point. Um, I think I'll top up on that saying like the, if you, if you want to fight for a story, I feel that sometimes you get like a great pitch um, but maybe the writer's not that strong or like you just want to tweak it a little bit. And I think this comes part and parcel with being like, don't be 
like don't take it personally and don't get offended if an editor wants to work with you on something or sort of refine a pitch like be really open to your edits i think that's one way to like keep that relationship going with an editor especially if you want to keep going and i and i think too like that only just makes you a stronger writer um and sometimes maybe the edits are not really like about you but it's about like the tone of the publication and so like a different editor would have different edits for you um so be flexible in in that way i would say um always meeting deadlines so i have a friend who is the editor of exclaim and um he he kept getting work with them over and over and over again he's like oh like i must be just like a really great writer but what he came to realize was that he was like one of probably 25 percent of the writers who always handed in clean copy on time so they're like okay alex let's keep having you on and then he became the editor of this publication so yeah that's a great way to keep your foot in the door also i would say yeah leverage your connections and keep taking people out for coffee or for a sandwich a, a publication that i used to write for actually got sold and it got sold to somebody that i ended up actually knowing from journalism school so i was like hey do you want to go for lunch and now i'm writing for the publication again after they switched ownership so keep yeah keep trying to meet people in person yeah, I, I really have to echo everything that's been said. Um, sending pieces as clean as possible to start with per, at literary magazines, like we are overworked. Um, so it, it can be a thing in your favor looking for me as an editor, looking at it and being like, I won't have to do a ton of editorial on this piece. That's a big Thing in its favor and again if you do get editorial notes being responsive to them that doesn't mean that you can't set anything but try and consider why these editorial notes are coming to you and um, take them under advisement um, and answer as quickly as possible that doesn't mean you need to be like glued to your smartphone and answering emails right away but try and get back within like a couple business days because generally once we get into production things move pretty quickly and I don't want to be holding the magazine for one piece, unfortunately. Um, I really like looking, so Subtrans has themed issues previously twice a year, now once a year. I like when people interpret our themes in interesting and surprising ways and that might then make me consider that person to be someone to go back to for a future theme. Like, oh, I'm really interested, next year we're doing a trash issue. And so if someone did something really, really interesting for our forgiveness issue, I might be like, hey, is there anything on trash you're interested in writing about, <laughs> say? Yeah. Um, and I think being thoughtful in how you interpret themes can be a really good way to stand out. And again, we don't do a lot of in-person lately due to a global pandemic and all that. But when we do do um, our Vancouver and Lower Mainland lit scene, used to do group events and things like that. And just being at those events, making it clear that you're part of the community, getting to know people in person, taking the time, I think is a really, really great way to get people to recognize your name when it does come up. So as much as possible, just getting involved. Um, yeah. So we are getting close to my last question. So at this point, I actually just wanted to open it up to the floor to see if anyone had anything that had come up in the course of this discussion or if they had any other questions they wanted to ask. Yeah. Thank you very much for all this information. Uh, the definition of the word published yes, is really quite important these days. It could be anything from an online blog to the New York Times. So uh, if uh, someone submits something published before is that considered previously published uh, it hasn't been published say in a traditional publishing market but it's been in it self-published because i mean it's clear who owns the copyright but the question is whether that's considered previously for us, that would be considered previously published if it has appeared um, in any publication, whether self-published or online. Um, we buy first publication rights, and then the, the copyright reverts to the author. Sorry, I didn't catch the last thing. We buy first publication rights. Yeah, so if it has appeared online, whether it's in a blog or self-published, it would count as being previously published. Does, does anyone else have anything to... 
yeah, I guess that, that that would be the same. So if like, let's just say you had a Tumblr blog or something and you're like, oh, I want to sell you this story. Like if you've already published it, I'm not going to buy it because it's already out there. But if you had a new story, I would publish that. But if you're asking like, oh, somebody wouldn't want to publish you because you're not previously published, I would I would think that's not a consideration. It's about, um, you know, how good of a writer you are, how good your story is. And I think that I personally would be happy to be the first person who publishes you in that way. Yeah. Just a wee follow up. So is there a time period over which something that has been, say, in an online blog, self-published, no longer is out there and can be resubmitted? No, but there are there are magazines that do reprints. Um, so there are places that might be willing to to reprint it, but we wouldn't. Yeah, I would subterrain. Um, we will do um, new versions of previously published things, and we also do do excerpts in the magazine. So we just end up putting like a note under the byline, essentially saying like a previous version was published X Y Z or. Um, this can also be found at, um, in our most recent issue, we reprinted something that um, Dan Wells of Biblioasis Publishing had actually sent out in their newsletter. And it just really spoke to us and what we were trying to say with that issue. So we reached out to Dan and said like, hey, can we essentially publish your newsletter in our magazine? And then we just have a note that that is. So if, um, magazines or publications don't have it obvious in their writer's guidelines where they fall on that, I would say don't be afraid to send them an email to check because some will actually publish things like that. Like we, mm -hmm. we would certainly consider it. Yeah? Um, this is maybe more like journalism specific, but I think like part of the stressful part That's a good question. I feel like that would be a great question for you. I, I'll be honest. I personally am not a great pitcher, but I am a great freelancer and that I will keep the relationships once like I've had my first pitch and I'm like, I'll take anything you throw at me. Sure. Um, but I think you, I feel like you are a really great creative pitcher. It uh, like. Well, I've done a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, and a really and a and a big one, right? Like, how do you how do you find a really good story, basically, right? Um, yeah, and there's there's a lot I could say about that, but I guess in a nutshell, like you know, first of all, you know, start with you know find some find something you're interested in, right? Um, and then take a look at first thing is is who else has done what on it, right? So read up everything else that's been you know not everything, but you know get a sense of what else has been covered on this topic? And then A, that'll make you kind of an instant expert on it. And B, it'll very often, like when I do that, I, that's where I find, you know, angles on it, personalities in it, you know, that that haven't been done or that give me ideas that I'm like, oh, huh. Like, you know, okay, there's been a hundred articles written about Fairy Creek, but there's this one like particular protester that just like got this passing mention who sounds really interesting there. Like, whatever they're you know from tasmania and they're an iraq war veteran and like, huh i wonder what's up with that person let me let me see if i can get a hold of that person you know what i mean so just you know sort of see what else has been done and then look for see what snags your interest right like look for the angles the people the whatever um and the other thing is just to kind of keep your keep your sort of senses open all the time like be looking for stories all the time because they come at you in all kinds of different ways, right? It's like somebody you meet at a party that's like, that has some super weird occupation or that just came from back from some trip and they like saw this thing that they couldn't believe, you know, or, you know, it can be just like, you know, when you're walking around and you're like, there's some nonprofit that, you know, serves some community you've never even heard about before, you know? The, so just to kind of, sort of always be looking, right? And always be like, when things trigger your interest, like kind of be alert to like, why, huh, what's interesting to me about that? Is it because like, oh, it it, it connects to this other issue and maybe it, you know, uh, 
you know, it sparks something in me that, that I don't know about, that I want to learn more about. That's sort of, that's sort of the first clue. All right. So we have about five minutes left. So I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. I'm just thinking about if I was going to break into bigger publications, and I often see their guidelines start with this short piece. So part of the question is, is that like my mind fits in terms of longer feature length -like pieces? So would you say take their advice and start with short piece? Um, and then also yes. Yes, again. <laughs> so yeah, just to just to elaborate. So yeah, I mean, everybody wants to write the long, deep, you know, heartfelt, beautiful, soul searing features. Everybody wants to do that. Um, it's hard and not everybody is good at it. And they're and editors are going to be are much more reluctant to like, give you an assignment like that if they don't know you can at least deliver the goods uh, that you can at least like you know that you've at least got some chops and that you're dependable right so so yeah writing for those shorter pieces that are a lot easier to pitch that are a lot easier to sell that's a really good way to get your foot in the door and and get that relationship going and convince them that actually you're smart and you're competent and you're dependable right so yeah i mean i that's how i got my foot in the, in the door at a lot of lots of places um and also they're you know they're easier and they're quicker turnover and you can make a little more money and you can you can be doing more of them and you can sort of be moving your your career forward more quickly rather than spending months on a feature that you know you might not you might not be able to sell so yes to that um what was the second thing that you said oh yeah multi-purposing a hundred percent a hundred percent so like most places don't want to do reprints like especially now that everything's online like it's, it's really it's almost impossible to sell a straight reprint but what you can do and what i did a lot especially when i was starting out is like take one story and spin it for a different audience because pretty much every magazine serves a niche right it might be a really big niche you know it might be rolling stone that's like covering you know millions of music readers or it might be like a really you know, like a local publication that's just covering like local bands or, or whatever it is, but everybody's got like a particular audience in mind. So, so I used to do this all the time. Like there was, again, when I was in Bosnia, I did this story about, I went to this, there was this group of Canadian volunteer doctors who had gone over to this refugee camp to be volunteer doctors, right? Like nice story. So I did a story about it for the Vancouver Sun because it's Vancouver doctors, right? And what does the Vancouver Sun want? They want stories about Vancouver. Anything that's got a Vancouver angle, that's what that's what they're about. Um, so that's where I started with. Um, my dad is, is a psychiatrist. He he told me about there's like like the sort of the world of professional magazines that I didn't know anything about. But basically, every trade, every like you know profession out there has publications right and we never see them they never like if you're not in that world you don't see them but they're out there right as you know hillary peach can can attest better than anybody in this room probably but basically there's a whole world of like trade and professional magazines that are really like they want stories most of the stories they get are really boring and they're super psyched if you can bring them something that's like actually interesting and relevant to their audience that's out of the ordinary so like so I didn't even know this thing, this world existed, but because my dad got the Ontario, like doctors monthly, whatever it was, the like, you know, the monthly magazine that went out to like every medical professional in Ontario, he told me about them. I pitched them this same story, but like much more kind of medically, right? Like it's like about doctors. And I just basically the same story, but with a lot more, with some more information about whatever the specific, you know, practices that they were doing and the equipment that they brought, just like more kind of technical, sold it to them. One of these doctors was Jewish. There's also a whole world of like ethnic and religious publications, right? That want to know, you know, there's a whole world of Jewish publications I know about because I'm Jewish. 
Um, and they just want to know about cool stuff that Jews are doing. So I wrote, you know, turn it into a profile about this one Jewish doctor doing this cool thing. Same story, like 80% of the information was the same, but like I turned it into three different articles. And you can do that with practically any article that, that you write. If you just think about in terms of like, how can I spin this? What like what elements are in this story that would appeal to a specific audience, to a particular audience? Great. Thank you so much for that, Vince. And this actually does take us to the end of our time. I really want to thank you all for joining us and heartily thank our panelists for sharing all of their information. Um, if you are interested in picking up any of the panelists' books, they should be um, at the 32 books table. And you can also visit both Event and Subterrain upstairs at the skating rink if you're interested in picking up any issues of the magazine. Uh, is there anything else anyone wanted to say before we sign off? And thanks so much for having us. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank great. you all so much. Please enjoy the rest of the work.